Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live brought to you by Crowcast. Apologies for being a couple of minutes late, courtesy to Windows updates. But we're here and ready to go. And joining me, as usual, uh, our cast of thousands, we have Peter J. How are you going, Peter? Good, mate. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Donkey Magoo, how are you, mate? Yeah, not too bad, Fiend. How are you? Not too bad for an old fella. And Macca, of course. How are you going, mate? Delighted to be here, mate. <laughs> Very good. Without further ado, and uh, you boys in the chat, I don't know whether you can hear my music uh, in, sorry, in uh, Discord. I don't know whether you can hear my music, so I'll talk you in. But we'll uh, head off into Crow's News, shall we? <laughs> what have we got? It's a bit around. Well, I thought one of the interesting things that came out of um, the post-match press conference uh, on Friday evening and um, to say that Don Pike's last couple of presses have been a little bit more instructive than what they usually are. But it was interesting that he was um, questioned about Taylor Walker and he uh, he pretty much said that um, he referred to the limited and restricted pre-season that, that Tex had had and and um, that they were trying to manage him through some games, but it didn't really quite work out. So really what they're, what it's about at the moment now for Texas is, is actually getting a, a mini pre-season into him. And then, of course, news broke today about you know Rory Sloan, three or four weeks as well. And so it seems to me, and we were just discussing this a little bit off air, and apologies to the listener, because, listeners because that's probably why we're a couple of minutes late because we got <laughs> involved in discussion. But um, uh, it, uh, it seems that th- there's a bit of a resetting of expectation and... We, um, we're looking like we're trying to get, um, you know, um, decent pre-seasons into some players who perhaps <laughs> didn't um, have the benefit of uh, of that earlier in the year. Yeah. Also, I think, uh, Pete, that, uh, you know, for them in one way, the jig was up in terms of uh, the, the media that was going out, the, the, the PR that was, was going out and the misinformation that was being said about the injuries. Um, in fact, I was watching... I think it was a Sunday Sunday uh, football show on Channel Nine, or it was either or well, the one on Seven, and the panel were having a big laugh about um, Adelaide, who said that they they didn't send any misinformation. Everything they sent out is correct, and then they all had a big laugh. So yeah, 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 ha ha ha. And uh, you know, it, we were we were actually making ourselves look like fools with the publicity that was going out. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm probably a little bit more um, easy on the cover than you guys. I think I think they've been caught a couple of times, maybe going early with diagnosis on injuries, and it hasn't been quite right. And when the injuries evolved and it's changed, they've they've looked like gooses because they haven't got it right the first time. So I think I think they're being a bit more cautious with how they making sure they're giving out the correct information once rather than the wrong information three or four times. And um, uh, you know it can be a pain in the bum, and it looks like it's covering up and all those sorts of things, but. I'm, so I'm willing to give the club um, one last benefit of the doubt on this one. Um, uh, I do think that you can tell that uh, the players um, seem to be not being rushed back from these things and putting a bit more, um, uh, and, and I think what Pete just said and he touched on was that they're uh, focusing on uh, making sure everyone's cherry ripe at the end of the year. And I would rather, I'd rather just be a few blokes down now and everyone would be cherry ripe at the end of the year. So I'm actually happy with the strategy. I'd like yeah, to well um, point out, uh, Vardy Magic um, says in the chat, Matt Haas has to go. I and, that, I th- yeah. and I think this goes to the heart of the matter because what we're talking about is injury management and player management and what hasn't really been covered by the press up and, well, at all uh, apart from this show is the club's use of Kangatech in terms of... Uh, uh, a, a slight change or a new system of injury management and load management. And whilst uh, Kangatech have uh, supposedly been quite successful with North Melbourne, which is where it was born, um, Steve Saunders was, oh, and still is, I think, uh, the uh, head of um, fitness at North Melbourne, um, we've taken on that system. Uh, the system is uh, one of data-driven load management. So essentially they will monitor 
players loads uh, in terms of their, their muscle capacity, their, their work, uh, etc. It's also supposed to be a system that monitors um, uh, injuries uh, and uh, it's supposed to safeguard against what we're experiencing. And um, it's either a failure of that system or it's a failure of the implementation of that system. Um, and I think that a, a bit more focus wouldn't go astray on that area of our fitness department and our injury management because, to my way of thinking, that that's where the issues lie. Yeah, no doubt about that. The, the problem is what's been happening to the players in the first place. Uh, but then there is a, as uh, G said, there is a disconnect between the, the actual fitness people and the people that are speaking to the public and saying what actually did happen. Um, and or, where, or what the status is. But if you're so, using a if you're using a system maker that uses certain words, and the word the buzzword that's come out of the club this year more than any other is awareness. If you're yes, using a, if you're using a system that that uses certain terminology and uh, um, is different to perhaps the system that might have been used in the past, which is what we've always used in terms of our communication, then. I think that's where the messaging has gone astray because not only I think are they trusting what the system is telling them and then getting shot in the foot when it's not ac actually accurate, but they're also using terminology that perhaps we're not used to hearing from the club, um, and I think that's thrown a lot of people out as well. I and look, Steve Saunders is still involved at North Melbourne, so you can only think that we've bought the the technology and bought the 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 system and the methodology which means that it's an implementation issue down at the club. Um, I note that Kanga Tech's also been bought by uh, the Utah Jazz and the NBA, and <laughs> perhaps coincidentally, Utah Jazz is probably uh, the club that has suffered the most hamstring injuries in the NBA this season. So, <laughs> no, it's actually true. Actually true. Yeah. So I don't know whether this system is flawed or whether Saunders uh, needs to have a, a much more hands-on approach in terms of the implementation to make sure it's effective, but it it's it has threatened to derail our whole season. We're Absolutely. just lucky that we're in the position that we're in because it it's derailed our system. They obviously measured that Tex was all right to come back, and Tex is, um, you know, initially it was the glute, but now he's complained about he had a sore knee, he had a few other niggles. You know, Rory was a weak injury. It's now been it's going to be six weeks at least. Uh, we've got Brad Crouch with ongoing osteitis pubis that they didn't even want to call that in the first place. We've got Wayne Miller I with not it. no. Well, he did, but no one else wants to call it that. And Burton actually said that Brad Crouch didn't know what was wrong with him, which is and absolutely they, ridiculous. Correct. And yes. and we've got Miller out with uh, what is it? Hamstring tendonitis, knee tendonitis, bloody what big is toe what tendonitis. Is What's hamstring tendonitis? Oh, it's tendonitis where the hamstring meets the bone, basically. Behind the knee is how... And all, all of, a lot of these... Tendon, well, any tendonitis injury is an overuse injury. Tendonitis is caused by overuse. And so they've obviously loaded up on our players on pre-season. They haven't managed the load correctly, which is exactly what they're supposed to have employed that system to do. And as a consequence, we've got blokes that are breaking down or re-injuring hamstrings like we've had Matt Crouch. Matt Crouch hasn't had a hamstring his whole life and he's had two in six weeks. There's Correct. definitely oh. something going on. And Brett Gibson, Burton... Gibson was the best example. Yeah. Only 130 games in a row for North Melbourne. And he yep. comes here in one pre-season and, uh, you know, p uh, pings a hammy. Eight weeks. Yeah. Eight what? weeks for Gibson. Unbelievable. Yeah. And look, to me... It, but this has got Burton all over it. Okay, Burton likes to be cutting edge. Uh, Burton is in charge of footy operations, and we both know, well, we all know that he's got um, hands on with the fitness department, even though he's not in charge of that area anymore. He came on radio last week. Um, I heard it in oh, the yeah, most defensive, outrageous. outrageous interview I've heard from an Adelaide club. I've official for quite that. some, probably since Stephen Trigg called us all agitators and basically said he was offended uh, by people calling into question the club's messaging. Well, I find it offensive, and I'm sure we all do, 
find it offensive that the club is not being up front with what's going on down there. We're the only stakeholders that the club has. And yes, we don't own shares, but without us, the club doesn't exist. And I think blokes like Bird need to get off, get his head out of his ass, and actually remember who's paying the bills down there. I'm with you 100%. I heard that Burton interview, and I was disgusted with him. I always had a reasonable opinion of Burton until this particular, until this year in particular. I always wondered whether he's been promoted to his level of incompetence, actually, as being the football director overall. Uh, and certainly after listening to the way he spoke on the uh, radio and the way he was virtually talking about us, the media, etc., uh, and exonerating himself, and I think I think I stand by that, and I have big question mark against Burton as the uh, director of football. In- interesting to note which club is on the top of the injuries premiership table at the moment mm-hmm. in a good in, you know, in a good way top. You know who that is, don't you? Mm-hmm. Brisbane Lions, the, the ex club, exactly right. Mm-hmm. You know we've we've hired a guy, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but it, it, pass, d- pass on it. <laughs> but I've done a bit of research on this because it, it's annoyed me, and I wanted to I wanted to get some more information on Kangatech and where all this came from. So it's been on my mind for the week. But you know, we employed Brett Burton on the back of um, a uh, basically a, a, a sports science TAFE course that he did. Uh, his good record in uh, with the players association as a representative, so he gained a good rep- uh, good reputation out of that. He started up his own sports and fitness business and then he got picked up by the Lions they had a terrible terrible run with injuries under his tutelage at Brisbane Brisbane let him go well you know we quote unquote poached him from Brisbane but I don't think Brisbane put up much of a fight he comes over to Adelaide he gets one good season out of us on the back of the previous bloke's work Nick Poulos who ironically is currently lecturing internationally on injury management (laughs) it's a true story Macca um, it, no, was on, no. it was on his Twitter feed last week. Um, you know, yeah, and then how, he, ironic, how ironical is that? And, and then he brings in his offsider, Matt Haas, who I don't pers- I think Matt Haas is just implementing whatever he's been told to implement. But uh, and and then we promote Brett Burton to general manager footy operations. Now, do you reckon that Brett Burton's got the same CV as David Noble had when David Noble Not- was appointed general manager football operations? Not on don't, forget, don't forget, though, Brett Burton and Rue are thick as thieves and have been for a long time. Yeah. They're very close friends. What, what I don't forget, and you, Pete. And you, know, and you know, you know as well as I do how the Adelaide Football Club operates and yeah. has always operated. Yeah. And that's never going to change. Well, well but this is a thing, Pete, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Macca, but this is a thing because you and I and Macca, we all sat around in that conference room 12 to 14 months ago and we listened to Andrew Fagan talk about getting best in class in terms of our football operations, particularly our, our fitness uh, department. Now, I, under- I, I agree with you. Um, you know, Rue and Bird are uh, thick as thieves, best mates, and I don't have a problem with that at all. But if we're going to start going down that road, then all, we, all we're doing is recreating what we, what we tried to replace in the first place. And I think we've been sold up the garden path. And when you consider that there's precious little that the members can do at a board level because of the fact, uh, the, the manner in which the board is elected and, and the way that the member nominations are, uh, are carried on. We don't have much say in terms of how the club is run. So to then turn around and be offended by the very people that you're relying on for your revenue and that you don't allow to have any sort of operational input into the club, I mean... That's they're just bloody lucky that they're they've got such a following because if this was Port Adelaide and Port Adelaide were treating their members like this, they would have members dropping off like flies. Yeah, I 100 percent agree with you. Another thing about directors of football, if you go and have a look at all the other clubs and look at the guys that are uh, that are occupying those positions in other clubs, they are people who have worked in footy for a long, long time in various positions and uh, understand all the aspects of it. I mean, Burton's never been involved in list management. He's never been involved, yet he's in charge of it. Um, he's never been involved in so many different things, and yet he's, uh, in, he's in charge of it. Whereas if you go and have a look at the guys that run it in other clubs, 
these are these are guys that are, are steeped in football and are steeped in all the aspects of football. And I just think that um, when we had Trigg, you know, the jobs for the boys, man, and I was so glad that he went and I thought this would disappear and now we've got this situation. And uh, he brings in his mates, as you quite correctly said, Phoenix, and it's blown up in our faces. So I think you're right, Pete. I think that they have uh, recalibrated everything, and I think they've they've put a couple of blokes out to pasture, um, which they've needed to do. Uh, whether they have um, uh, removed Kangatech from the equation, or whether they've got some advice or or changed the way that they're utilising that uh, system, I'm not sure. But they've obviously uh, drawn a line under Sloney and drawn a line under Tex. Um, Sloney not due back until round fifteen. Tech's not due back until round thir- uh, 13, or is it the other way around? Something like that. Uh, Hawthorne for um, Tex, I think. Um, you know, that they've, they've all said, you know, they've come out and said, well, this, this injury isn't coming out, uh, progressing the, the way that we want it to. But no one has put up their hand yet and say, said that they've mismanaged those injuries. And to me, if you're coming off a, a short pre-season, or in Tex's case almost zero pre-season, why was he playing? It's not as if we've, got, we've not got other people that can come up and play. You know, what's Harry, what's Harry Deer done? Like, who, whose daughter did he bloody shoot to bloody not get a run? I don't think we shoot. <laughs> no, I'm being nice, but you know what I mean. I mean, like, he's obviously out of favour. Um, you know, someone needs to actually come out from the club and, and put their hand up and say, yeah, we've got a couple of these wrong. Um, and they need to do that in order to restore a little bit of faith um, in what the club's doing down there. I, I thought I thought Pikeney's press conference probably came as near as you're probably ever going to get to admitting they, they got it wrong with his pre-season. And that's why they're resetting him and... And um, and effectively giving him a preseason now. I, I think that he, without actually you know saying the words, we balls this up. Mm. Like, go, go back and if you haven't had a look at it, go 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 and have a yeah, look. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what you think at a later date. But I, I, I felt that you know he um, that was as close as we I, we're probably going to get. But the, but there was nothing on Sloan. My um my my impression of Pipes presses over the last couple of weeks is that he's actually been pissed off at injury management yeah. because I think the coach basically does what the fitness department tells him and plays mm. a bloke if, if like Pike would go I mean who knows but my take is that Pike would go to Haas or whoever and say is he right and they'd say yep here's the data here's the graphs here's the bloody readouts and all the rest of it he's right um, and they play him oh yeah no, that's what would happen so I don't think it's – I'm not blaming Don Pike at all. I think I think Don is probably no, as no, no, pissed no, no. off. And I think the players are probably as pissed off as well. Riley Knight's yeah. another one. Right, yeah. Riley Knight's been oh, completely I, mismanaged. I was going to raise that. <laughs> I was going to raise I'm disgusted. I'm anyway. Disgusted. And now, and we've, and now to... the worst thing of all, and uh, this is the tipping point for mine, now we've lost a bloody trainer to a hamstring. <laughs> I mean, if if that's not the straw of the boat, the camel's back, I don't know what is. The poor bloke. <laughs> yeah, but if you're upset, you know, just think about Macca's, they're upset because he hasn't been down there. <laughs> come on, Macca. Oh, come, come on, on mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think he'd be there a I few think in all times. Serious, in all seriousness, no, the, the, you know, if there is a, an upside to this, I, um, I feel... Um, I feel strangely comfortable about where the season's at. Um, you know, we're six three. Mm-hmm. You know, if we can if we can pinch two out of the next four, and we go to the bye, you know, at eight five, um, and then you know, um, our game after the bye is sort of in about six weeks' time. And if we can start looking at getting um, some players back and settling aside and having a reasonable run to getting, I think realistically now our best case scenario is you know fourth or one of those uh, five six positions for a home elimination i think that's our that that's probably what given our given looking at our the fixture and the draw that we've got i think that you know four five six is around is about where we land depending on percentage and other teams and i think though that if we can you know we've got that uh, I, I just have, i have a sense i don't know what you guys think but i i'm interested if you think that clubs have reorganised themselves a little bit 
because we, you know, the the the, the, the luster of the, if you like, the uh, of the top two finish seems to have gone. Certainly, the last two premiers premiers haven't had top two um, positions leading into the finals, and I just have a sense that the introduction of the bye um, after round twenty three has really separated the seasons and there seems to be the real sort of pre and post season now. Um, so I just get the feeling that, you know, maybe we're not, you know, certainly all's not lost. And, and uh, uh, you know, if we, um, if we get ourselves to a final series where we've got a pretty healthy list and, but also I think that we've struggled a little bit in the past with having a list that has, you know, we've had, you know, 24, 25 players who predominantly have played every game of the season. Um, and um, and we look a little bit banged up by the time we get to finals. I just have a feeling, and maybe it's hope more than anything that we that we probably that maybe this time we end up a little bit you know fresher when we approach the finals. And regardless of where we are um, seated at the start of the finals, that uh, that we have a, a reasonable crack at it. I think you're one hundred percent correct, Peter. I think that um, uh, last year you know everything was uh, flying along. We looked really good, um, and uh, Towards the end of the season, you know, everything started to tighten up. I mean, obviously, appendixes aren't necessarily, uh, you know, soft tissue injuries, but um, we were pretty sore and pretty tired going to the finals. I think that happened the year before as well, from memory, um, where we sort of ran out of gas in the last few games and definitely ran out of gas in a couple of those finals. I, I really hope that, um, and, I, and I agree with you, by putting some time into the, you know, the prolonged pre-seasons of guys like Tex and, and hopefully Brad Crouch and Sloan, I think it's going to come, we're going to about pay off in spades. I think we're thinking about it more like an NBA sort of season now, where you play your regular season and then and then the playoffs are a different ball game. And I think that's what we're looking at now. The one thing is though that we've got a hard run coming up at the moment. Yep. You know, uh, we've had a pretty easy run over the last four weeks. We we dropped the one really hard game that we did have, and that was against Port, and uh, well, we lost that in 10, ten ten minutes of madness on our part, um, but. Uh, the games that we've got coming up, that they are all winnable and they're all losable. And with the, it'll depend on the the quality of the team we can put out and the effort that it gives, because it isn't by by any means anywhere near our best possible team if everybody was fit. So, and that's going to be the case, uh, really, right up to the bye. So, um, you know, we we. All the games are winnable, but they also they're all losable as well. So it's a question of just uh, whether we're going to be good enough to win with what we've got. What yeah, else? Have we, what else have we got in the news before we perhaps have a quick chat about the uh, the dogs game? China. There was a little. There was a little bit of. Um, uh, sorry, just sticking. If I jump in, sticking with the crazes, a lot of uh, talk in the media over the last few days about Tom Lynch um, and the fact that he's you know spent a bit of time in Melbourne. I think that that uh, Mitch Cleary looked to be doing a little bit of muck raking on his master's behalf, um, and um, uh, he perhaps didn't spend as much time in Melbourne as uh, um, as he first thought. Mm, yeah. um, I also I also read that. So, and I didn't actually hear them, but apparently some comments on on radio from Tom Lynch didn't sound particularly hopeful. Very non. So anyway, that's a Rowie, very yeah. So there's a, a there's a certainly a potential lever um, at the no pun intended at the start of the uh, at sorry the end of the year. Rowie said that he was in Melbourne looking at houses. Is there a soft um, list turnover going on at the Crows? Is that we've wondered about strategy and certain low balls uh, over the last couple of years. Is there a soft, a, a, a soft turnover going on at the moment? I absolutely think there is, and I, and I, I genuinely, this is, you know, I don't know any, this is not in, based on any inside information, but just my gut feeling, is that I think we're really setting ourselves for this draft period. Um, we've already got um, two first-round picks um, in the kit bag. I think we probably understand potentially that we're going to lose Sloan, but he's restricted. We might be able to snag a first-rounder there. And if Tom Lynch goes as well, it's four first round picks and two second round picks. Don't forget, we've got the the Gibbs second round pick yep. as well. So we're going to have, you know, um, six really good draft picks in a, in what is shaping to be an extremely strong draft. Now, we're, whether they look at you know using those individual picks on individual, you know, six individual players or packaging some of them up to try and get a bit higher in the rank for 
the likes of Haitley, Rosie. Um, I think Rankin and Lukosius will be gone. But um, yeah, I, I think that there's a there's a, a real reset on at the end of this year. Well, the, you know the way that the way it's been going, um, we've got uh, Siege is one that's going to come up uh, for renewal, and he was on Channel Seven, I think it was uh, tonight. And the way he was talking, he's he's only too happy to sign up uh, and uh, for a much more extended contract. Uh, but he is a guy that, um, if we, pardon my language, but we fuck about like we do with all our contracts and. Often from no, they'll, they'll sign up seats, but he's and he 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 won't go anywhere. He's he's playing his, the best football of his career. No, he won't no logically that. he should. Yeah, logically he shouldn't be going anywhere. But no. um, when I heard the Lynch interview as well, and you know he said it's a tricky situation, and I think going by that is that we are definitely uh, poised to lose one of those two. It's going to be either Sloan or Lynch. We I might think it'll be both. both. And I, th- I, 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 yeah. I, I I reckon it actually uh, points to one of the reasons we uh, decided to pay a little bit more than what we were previously uh, prepared to pay for Bryce Gibbs um, because, uh, you know, Matty Crouch, without Gibbs and, and with Sloan going, Matty Crouch essentially becomes the uh, the number one man in our midfield, yeah. uh, Richard Douglas notwithstanding. And I think <laughs> that probably looked... Well, I mean, in terms of gains played and experience... Um, you know, let's not forget that Richie's a past club champion. Um, but so I think that probably added a little bit of impetus in getting Bryce back to the club um, to shore up a bit of experience. Obviously, Bryce is coming home, so he's not going anywhere once he's here. Um, and I just over the last couple of weeks, it's just smelled to me as if, um, as if there's just this might be the last roll of the dice for the current list. I think. And questions have got to be asked on Tex as well. I mean, not a not a knock on on Tex Walker at all, but you know he's played under duress for a couple of years now, and uh, we haven't probably seen the best of him. We've seen flashes of what he can do. I wouldn't mind betting that uh, there's a bit of a transition of the captaincy over the next twelve to eighteen months um, to the new breed. And uh, Tex, I mean, Tex is twenty seven. Does anyone honestly think that Tex is going to be able to go on past 30? Well, who knows? Who knows? Some of them, some of them get an absolute shock. I would never have thought that uh, Jared Waite would be 35 and running around at North Melbourne. Oh, Jared Waite's just one of the champions of the game, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, I know what you mean, Fane. I mean, yeah. in days gone by, you could have said, right, as he gets older, we'll just stand him in the goal square and, and play him out of the goal square. Oh, he yeah, can't do that anymore. No, no, he oh. can't. Those days are gone. I, I, I think yeah, Tex. I think it, I'd I'd hate to think that that's right, Phoenix. You're probably right on rationality, but it, I just feel like he's never quite he's never quite given us an extended time at hitting his straps, you know. And uh, and I, I think you might be right rationally, but I just. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well, Donkey, at all. But maybe removing the captaincy from him will stop him wanting to bloody play when he's not right. Um, yeah. And it might actually free him up to, to finish off his career on, on, on a good note. I mean, he was terribly unlucky to get that knee. He was just on the brink of breaking out into buddy-like form when that happened a yeah. couple of years ago. Yeah. And it, yeah, let, let's be honest, you know, he's never really been the same since he's been restricted in his movements Particularly yeah. laterally, he doesn't. He hasn't got confidence going for the ball in the air. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's just shit luck because he's a great player and a great fella, and he's been an, a fantastic club man and continues to be. Um, and I don't think it would actually be a bad thing for him to say, "Mate, you've got us through one of the toughest periods the club has gone through with with field passing, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. You know, let's transition it off and give you a couple of years where you can just play footy and enjoy the last couple of years of your career. Mm. I, I still don't think we'll lose, but you know, and look, you guys have put up a very, very good case for it, and you might well be right. But I, I think that one of either Lynch or Sloan will still be here. Lynch, more likely, but, in my opinion. What do you reckon, Peter? Oh, I think Sloane is gone, and um, I, I personally, I, I, I'm, I'm 
pretty sure Sloan's gone. Um, and Lynch, I'm guessing, um, I, um, I think he'll go as well. I, and I don't think that we. I think that we see Fogarty. We see um, in, in particular, and we, and, and we. I mean, jeez, we just we saw on Friday night the potential that he has to play yeah. that role leading up the ground. Um, where he, uh, you know, gives the don't argue, gives the ball, turns around, kicks a fifty meter player and uh, ball and, and and hits Eddie on the tit. I mean, you know, it, it was, you know, ridiculous class. And, yeah. and he's a player that shows that he can, you know, play that kind of role further up the ground. So I think yeah. they'd be comfortable in losing Lynch, and um, and I think that um, as I said. Uh, oh, you've also got um, don't forget Himmelberg, um, yep. who I think will, will burst through in the next you know one to two years. Um, he's a terrific player, and I think that he will. My my gut feeling, just from everything that I've seen of him at um, SNFL level in his junior football. Here, I, this is this is this is what I'll put out there. We're I recording this, recording will, this, Pete, recording it. <laughs> he will end up being the pick of the twenty sixteen. Drafts certainly Ooh. for us, and he'll. If you redo that 2016 draft in, I'd say 2021, um, Himmelberg will be you know minimum top 20 mm. in that right. draft. So there you go. I'm putting it out there. You so he will, you've always been a big fan of his. He will come. He will come on, and Fogarty will come on, and I, and well, Fogarty's already here, um, and I think that um, Lynch won't be a. Yeah, he's a terrific. Don't be wrong; he's a terrific player. But I think that they can probably see a first rounder coming, and I just, I just have that this feeling that they are really loading up for this draft. Do you reckon the target's Lacocious? I reckon the target's Lacocious. They'd love to get I, him. I know I, what what I can tell, and this is this is not really anything particularly exciting news, and I'm sure that um, this will not come as a, a surprise to anybody. But they've, they've, I know that they've certainly spent significant time with the family and. Yeah. And um and and you and you know Fiend very well where that connection comes yep. from. Yep, I've heard um, similar. So I know, I know factually that they've spent a lot of time with the family, but they've also, um, they've also been very very clear that the that, that there's a you know a number of really really strong SA kids, and that they're probably only going to be able to get one. Yeah, and so they so they so they're being realistic, and they and they're certainly being realistic with the family and saying that you know obviously, you know I mean, <laughs> I read um, 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 Nightmares Power Ratings. You know the guy that does it for ESPN, yeah, yeah. and um, he he had Lacocious as being the best draft prospect in the last ten years. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's not wrong either, uh, he, and he's just kicked on. He's just kicked. He's on. spectacular. So I don't, you know, the real. I mean, whether they get him or not, you know, I think it's. I don't know how realistic that is, but they'd really have to trade up to to, to number one. Yeah. Um. So I think that they'll. They're probably going to more likely, you know, even Haitley now. I think is going to, you know, he looks like he's going to be shooting up. So you yeah. might be left with maybe Rosie and you know Ranking. Rosie around the ten, the ten mark, ten twelve mark. Well, rank it's going to go to top three. You would think current. Yeah. You know, so the trouble is, is, is that with with both Haitley and Rankin, is is that they're playing and and Lukosius, all three of them are playing, you know, superb SNFL SNFL football. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are. And so, so they're the, rating. They're, the good thing they're, about it is the ratings though, are going through the roof. Yeah, the good thing is about it though is that a lot of the teams that are in the uh, the the first half of the first round of the draft, I don't. I think that mature age or, or proven players are going to actually be more important to those clubs than more young lads. You're looking at Carlton, you're looking at Brisbane, you're looking at those types of teams. And I think that's where we might have a little bit of um, sway because I definitely Carlton, Carlton don't need any more kids. They've raided GWS's pantry. They just need to 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 put some 100 gamers behind that squad, I reckon. And uh, similarly with Brisbane, you know, they've got a good uh, squad of kids, but I bet you they wouldn't mind someone that could, that's got a hundred games under his belt. So, so you reckon maybe maybe there. Tom Lynch in a Tom Lynch in a first rounder gets you how far up the ladder? Uh, Tom, Tom, I reckon that gets you into the top five. Oh, see, that, that that may see this is where they, this is something that they may think of doing. Surely that gets you into the top five. five. It, 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 well, I would have thought Lynch is a yeah. bloody good player. 
Well, yeah, he's all Australian squad. Exactly what Carlton needs, someone to lead up and hit up. They've got Casbolt. Yeah. Anyway. So that, that's, a, that's, I think that's where they're, and, and I, you know, again, I, all I can say, and, it does, and I'm sure that this is not any kind of startling news, They've met, they, you know, they've met with the Lacocious family. They've said that, look, we, we, you know, obviously we'd like to keep him in South Australia. We can only draft one. We're only going to we're only going to be able to actually throw enough, you know, collateral at this to be able to get one of these ki- of these South Australian kids. Yeah. When we were talking so, about the fitness people, we had a rule last year. Um, in the two, in terms of the um, list management people, uh, Pete, what's your knowledge of that? How they are regarded? You mean Reid? Yeah. Well, I don't know, mate. I mean, I probably don't know any more than you do. I, I um, you know, he seemed to be fairly well regarded. I mean, I, I had my concerns purely because it just felt to me like another jobs for the, for the boys. Um, but well, you obviously know, it was, but, he, you know, he, 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 he totally balls up the, the Gibbs deal in the the first year, but um, seemed to redeem himself in the second year. And I guess it's all a learning curve. But um, somebody has got to, someone's got to pull a miracle out at this year's draft to uh, to be able to snag one of these boys. Uh, that's all I would say. I think Reed's first year was a he, I think he was a bit of a victim of the transition because that all happened pretty quick. Um, and uh, yeah, I I still like the fact that Reed has had his finger on the pulse in terms of being a ex player manager. Um, and I've always been critical of the the uh, list management committee in terms of how they've handled certain players, Jared Lyon in particular. But as I said at the, at the beginning of this little conversation, uh, all of a sudden you think, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe there is a method to the madness. And as we've fleshed this out, it, uh, you know, without having any hard and fast facts, it's, it seems to at least justify um, some of their actions over the past couple of seasons. Yeah. Time oh, to oh, yeah, look, it's an interesting one. And... Um I think Lynch is more valuable than we than we in this this discussion that we put any, any emphasis on because but he's I don't replaceable. Think he I don't think he is because he, he covers that enormous amount of ground and he's been playing that particular role now for say three, four, five years and he understands it perfectly and he creates the spaces. Um, he does and he also is the conduit, the connector, as they call him. Uh, he does all those things, and, and I just think he's very, very valuable. And uh, only we, if you're going to continue to play that game plan, Maka. Yeah, yeah. But, well, that was the point I was about to make. Unless we're going to change the game plan, because we've signed up Jenkins, we've signed up uh, Betts, we've signed up uh, Tex, and um, we've got all the other in, and, and McGovern. We've all the other ingredients of the game plan that we play have been signed up, except for Lynch. Hmm. It'll be so, interesting to see how it pans out over the next uh, few months. If they, if, if they end up with Fogarty, Lacocious and Himmelberg, <laughs> let me tell you, that will be uh, something to write home about. Anyway, sorry, we all... Oh, plus we Mitch, Mitch things, McGovern. Sorry. Chuck Mitch McGovern in there uh, as Mitch well. McGovern, yeah, Chuck, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they reckon we're potent at the moment up forward. Bloody hell. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, do we want to talk about um, Bulldogs for a second? Let me just play that in for us. Obviously, Mac and I have had our two bits worth on Sunday night. Uh, Peter and Donkey, what were your thoughts? Oh, look, I, I um, didn't get along to the game. I, yeah, wet games and being on crutches doesn't really um, fit. So I, uh, I stayed <laughs> home Friday night and watched it on the box. And um, yeah, look, I, I actually thought it was a pretty decent game of footy given the conditions. And I thought it all boiled down to the fact that we just played it a bit more sensibly and, and played a bit better wet weather football. And was really really pleased for Camillus Yeoman picking up six coaches votes and just it was just a, a monster in the middle again and I think I said um, before the game that that if you're going to survive a um, a period like we have and to come out of it you know six three as we are you've got to find there's got to be players that you just don't think are going to step up and they and they do unexpectedly and for me there's been three players and that's um, Cam. Um, Hugh Greenwood and uh, Paul Seedsman. Those three players have just come from nowhere. They come from the clouds. And you, you, I mean, you, know, you can say that Hugh had a decent season last year, but not not like this year. And so they've really come from the clouds. And those three have really, uh, really carried us. Um, and we've got 
so much out of those three players that we weren't probably expecting. And so they continued, all three of them continued their great form as well as Bryce Gibbs. It just sort of, that real um, slogging contested game just, just really suited those players. And of course, you know, Eddie was mercurial. So it was, it was, I thought it was actually, you know, a reasonably, given the conditions, it was a reasonably entertaining game to watch and, and of course a terrific result for us. That's a good summary because without those three players that you mentioned, if they, if they had not evolved as they have this year, uh, I think our year would be absolute shit. What were your yeah. thoughts, Donkey? I, um, I uh, uh, in, in total agreeance with Pete there. Um, I just, um, just sort of sitting back and watching the game as a whole, you know, um, it was just really sluggy trench warfare. Um, and it was, uh, even though it didn't look, you know, it's not the most pretty free-flowing footy, um, it, you know, it was just a very entertaining game. And um, and I loved every minute of it. And I really love the fact that um, the three blokes that uh, uh, Pete just mentioned were so instrumental in just that constant crunching and um, just m- knocking the ball just that little bit forward, that little bit forward, um, until, you know, our extra polish sort of took over and, and we got moved the ball a bit faster and through the forward line. It was just, um, I, I think it was one of those really character-defining wins that um, we've managed to pull out a few times this year. Um, I think, you know, in both the Sydney, uh, the Richmond, and even that Bulldogs game, we were missing so many people. Um, we found that extra gear. We found that bit of gumption we needed to get over the line. And that's, I think that's a really important thing, uh, especially coming after, you know, what should have been a win the week before against Port. Um, just finding that little bit extra once we were down those couple more players um, was was pretty big and pretty exciting. I really love watching Fogarty play, and uh, uh, and he didn't quite get, um, you know, didn't quite have the magical night. But you know, his body oh, no, was that so don't argue contest. was pretty magical. <laughs> oh, I know, it was, <laughs> that was pure magic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I just meant like he didn't, uh, you know, he. If he'd taken two or three more of those marks, you know, where they sort of slipped through or bounced off the chest, I know it was wet, so, you know, you're not going to blame him. But, you know, he didn't quite have the um, the perfect night. But um, the amount of times where he'd, like, just throw his body at the contest, and that was enough to knock the Western Bulldogs bloke a little bit further away. So one of our blokes ran away with it instead and nabs a goal or, you know, gets the clean pass away. There was a lot of that sort of stuff. So, you know, the stuff you don't necessarily write down on a stat sheet, but um, him there affecting the play with that huge frame of his was just, you know, pretty awesome. Fiend, I know, I know you love stats, and I just want to rip these past you. These, um, the, the, those two monsters in the middle, yeah. Greenwood and Camelus Yeoman, forty-seven possessions, forty contested, contested. seventeen yeah. tackles, sixteen clearances from those two blokes. Yeah. I mean, that, that, it is uh, there's an unbelievable night at the office for those two big bodies, and um, oh, they are they they are keeping. I think I I tweeted that they are keeping the motor running. Those yep. two boys, they are keeping the motor 100%. running. Well, we gave 100%. our um, breakout award on, on Sunday night to uh, Cameron Greenwood, uh, closely followed by Hugh ellis Yolman, uh, <laughs> because what a one-two punch they are in the middle at the moment, and uh, it's such a credit Rash to them brothers. both. Such a credit. And partic- I know we've harped on it a bit, Pete, you and I are both fans, but Cam ellis Yolman coming back from that ACL, um, talk about a, a lesson in perseverance. Uh, I'm so happy That's for big. him. So happy for him that his form's continuing and improving. Uh, I feel like his um, his touches are becoming more damaging and more effective. Um, yeah, never been a doubt about him getting the ball, but I think it's just uh, he's just becoming a little bit more potent. And Huey Greenwood, uh, we re- remarked that he only had 69 percent time on ground, Pete. Uh, on Saturday night, and they Don Pyatt likes to just give just tail him off, you know, around the third quarter there, and and let him loose in the last. And we saw it against Port; he got the last four clearances, and he also had that purple patch last Friday night where he just got the ball continuously. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm. Might have been a bit handy in the third quarter against Port, though. Yeah, I know, but uh, yeah. Anyway, look. The only thing I'll put <laughs> the only thing I'll put forward for a quick discussion, and I'm conscious that we spent a lot of time up front talking, so uh, uh, it's nearly Pete's bedtime already. Um, but did did uh, Western Bulldogs' ineptitude and ridiculous game plan paper over a few things for us? Because let's face it, had they played a better style of footy and and uh, not messed around with it, uh, perhaps it might have been a bit closer. 
No, our oh, pressure. No, no question. No question that, that they played a that they played a poor brand of football. They didn't play wet weather football at all. So, uh, um, it, 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 in that respect, I agree with you. It's probably, you know. You could, you could argue that it's difficult to assess our performance, but I suppose it's pro- probably being a bit unkind because what you'd say is, well, we just played the conditions perfectly mm. um, and, you know, and we uh, and we did enough to, you know, to scratch out a six-goal win, which, you know, um, under the conditions was a, was a pretty comfortable win in the end. Probably 12 and goals. And kept it two goals. Yeah. Well, it's totally the wrong game plan with that, the, the excess handball. Then the ratio was ridiculous, even on a dry day. And the, the mm. uh, number of handballs they had. Well, they and went one to one, basically. Well, it was interesting. It was interesting what their coach said because he said that when he was queried about why they played that way, he said, "Well, I, why did why didn't you get them to kick it?" And he said, "Well, I did. Well, obviously they don't listen to him because <laughs> so, they just didn't so, change, didn't, disgusting didn't change or not. The headline yeah. should the headline should be "Beverage loses the players," then shouldn't it? <laughs> it would be if it was Adelaide. Yeah, that's right. Kane gone to be all over it. Yep. Um, yeah. I don't, I, I don't know about papering over the cracks because we won by playing really hard footy, you know. And so yeah. it wasn't like we, you know, it wasn't like we'd flashed our way to, to victory. We played, won by playing really hard footy, and we got the the midfield slog was was what it was. But we won the game at either end of the ground. Like our defence was amazing. Like where you know it was it Jake Kelly sort of standing up one on one. The ball was basically through the back. Didn't lose his feet. You know, keeps it front. We don't kill the goal. There was the ridiculous slide for a kick where we actually conceded a goal, you know, um, and I don't think nobody nobody would actually think that's a free kick. And so our defense, our guys at the back made them earn everything that went into that forward 50. And so that's why they scored so many points, not just because they were running into open goals and yeah. shanking them. It's because we're putting pressure on all their kicks. And, and we won the other one up forward because we have a brilliant forward line and we have people that can finish like Eddie Betts who, you know... Um, I don't know where he pulls those things from, but um, obviously that's why he's got big shorts. Just, just classy. That first and, goal was all class. Oh, and maybe, put, maybe Fiend, let's put it. Let's put it a different way. Let's let's just accept. I think that we all know that there are a number of cracks there that mm. that we're trying to paper over. Every yeah, well, week. that's true. That's true. <laughs> and yeah, I, and I think really we, we accept and we know and and we're just we're just going. And we're just trying to scratch out each win that we can yeah. uh, until such time as we can get a full kit out there and um, and start playing some, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, a, a strong brand of football for a more consistent period of time. But there's inconsistency there for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so, and, and that's going to be the problem with the young fellas, it's going to be the inconsistency. But, yeah. Um, but, you know, even, even looking at Rory Sloan from the North Melbourne game last year to every game he played since, like, we actually haven't had a good run out of him for almost a season now. No. Like, he, well, since um, he started getting he tagged, output. yeah, no, he hasn't been able to beat the tag. Yeah. Like, in and so you know, is Greenwood and CY actually more effective than him on the ground at the moment? That's well, possible. And you mentioned um, the inconsistency from the young lads. I, I would argue that it's actually the inconsistency from our seniors that has been the problem. Our, our young lads, Duday, Greenwood, Ellis Yolman, uh, they've who were probably the th- the three uh, main young pe- lads that have been uh, put into the gun. They've performed admirably week in week out. It's been Douglas and and those blokes that have come in and out of it. Yeah, and if you have a look back to the grand final game, you know, and look at the Richmond side, you know, we played a lot of old blokes that um that were probably a bit banged up and injured. They were quite happy to cull that that those few players that mm. weren't quite up to playing it. And they put in the Grahams who played five games, Townsend, and I yeah. think there was a couple more. And those guys went out and won the footy and got the job done. Yeah. And we've got to back our youth in a bit more, I think. All right, let's uh, segue that straight into the Melbourne match, uh, which is going to be a big challenge uh, uh, in context of the season and, and limping to the bye in good nick. Um, and obviously it's going to be the complete opposite in terms of conditions uh at uh, in Alice Springs, donkey, you're going. I assume. I am. We're um, loading up the car with um, with the uh, the old nag and the my young equines. You and, um... what, the, <laughs> what the hell? Seriously, <laughs> we may never hear from you again after that. <laughs> oh, look, one day, you guys, I just won't be on the cast, and I'll be stabbed in my sleep. I think we all know what's going to happen. <laughs> like, we just sort of we just sort of accept we accept what it is, and we just move on. <laughs> Take but, every day um, as it comes. <laughs> That's right. Every day is a new day. Uh, yeah, no, we're going to um, we're going to be uh, jumping in the car. I'll just give everyone a little a little tour of, tour of the the ride down. So you turn and you turn 
uh, left from my house, right, and then left onto the Stuart Highway, and then you keep going. <laughs> keep going. You keep yeah. going. Keep going straight for the next <laughs> 1,300 kilometres, and, and, you, and you arrive. Um, oh, uh, no, nah, it's not too bad. We, there's a few different beautiful places to go through. You've got Wycliffe Well, which is where um, Rodney Williams goes to look dude, at his UFOs. Dude, we're not looking for a tour guide. I just happened to mention that oh. you were going to try oh, a fucking park, for God's sake. I'm just, trying, just mixing it up a bit. Jesus. <laughs> Big mistake there, Fiend. Yeah, I know. I, I gave him an inch. I gave him an inch. Oh. And all of a sudden, we're bloody South Aussie with Cozzy in Northern Territory. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I just wanted to mention the Robbie Williams yeah, thing. Too. Yeah, I know. Nah, bloody name dropper. But back yeah, on topic, uh, this is going to be a tough game. This is going to be a tough game because, I've, you know, I've been watching Melbourne and they are in very good form there. They haven't uh, played the, the real gun sides and this is a, it's, it's a test for them as well. But um, this is a better side that we're going to meet here than we met, than we met uh, last week because this side is... Uh, got players in form, and they've got lots of good players as well. So uh, yeah. it'll be a real test for us. If we win this, I'll be delighted. Don't think we will. Um, I don't think we match up. <clears throat> for whatever reason, I think they're just uh, their, their current side, the current lineup is just one of those we just don't seem to match up well on. And we've had uh, difficulty against them, even with a full-strength team over the last two or three years. Um, so I, I don't see that changing and I just think that the their capacity to bring the the, uh, the the pressure to the ball carrier they seem to be they just seem to be able to step it up a notch with us and um, um, and even when as I said we've had a full deck and we've been playing well and even at home um, we, we we struggle um, I know they haven't beaten anybody and I think that that is the one thing that probably plays into our favor the fact that um, I think that when you're a side that plays, you know, three or four games on the trot against pretty ordinary opposition, you become very, very used to your system going your way um, and you don't really have that system questioned um, and things roll along, you know, reasonably well. And when um, you have that entrenched uh, trust, I suppose, in the system and the way that you're playing. When that suddenly is being, that's called into question, which I know that we are good enough that we certainly will on Sunday call that into question at some point. Um, it can sometimes fall away quite quickly because uh, they're just not used to having to deal with it. So that that I think plays into our favour, um, and so that gives us a chance. Um, it's on neutral territory, so that gives us a chance. Um, so you know, um, I, I'd say probably seventy thirty against. I'll certainly be tipping Melbourne. Uh, I think they're just playing a bit too well at the moment. I don't think we'll quite have the cattle to get over them, but I do expect us to give a good account of ourselves. I think having a look at this stat sheet uh, from last week, is it makes for fairly interesting reading because I don't think you would expect them to get nine goals out of their two small forwards in Melcham and, um, uh, what's his name, Alex Bullen. Um, and I think we cover those types of players far better than we ha- may have done in previous seasons uh, with Diday and... Um, I don't know whether we'll get Lukey Brown back. He's probably out for another. Um, Kelly. Kelly's good. Kelly's, Kelly, good Kelly's the shut down there as well. Uh, they only got one goal out of Jesse Hogan. I think he was playing a little bit higher. but um, And then they got four from Tommy McDonald. So I don't know whether they're going to they're gonna find it as easy to have uh, multiple avenues to goal like they did against Carlton. And, uh, you know, really they got most of their output through the midfield from Jones and Oliver. Um, so I... Uh, a uh, little bit from Angus Brayshaw as well, who's playing quite well. But, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not as uh, bullish on Melbourne as you are, Pete. I know they're playing well, but I think they rely on a few. Um, and I think that uh, we have the capability to shut them down. My, my, my concern is probably our own ability to score um, with Tex and, and Mitch McGovern out of the, out of the team. Um, that... that- They've definitely got one ace, though, Fiend. They've got uh, Maxi Gorn, and there's no doubt that he's in outstanding form, and he's the number one ruckman in the league. And he's uh, also dangerous around the, the forward line as well. Uh, you know, he often gets dicks down there and takes a huge mark and kicks a goal. And yep. uh, and he'll he'll put his hand uh, first on the ball at the ruck thing, ruck throw ups about fifty odd times. Um, he's in outstanding form, and. Uh, I think Jacob's good, good. I saw Jacob said he's setting himself for this game, but I think he'll get cleaned up big time. Well, I don't I think it's the end of the world if we do get done. I mean, 
I reckon we'll I reckon we'll hit back against GWS. I think it's a very that's a very winnable game at home against oh, GWS yeah. in their current state. And um, one of Frio or Hawthorne away, I think we can win one of those two. Yeah, I'm not so confident about Frio away. Um, and then uh, the problem is the game after that. Um, everyone's having trouble coming back from Optus Stadium. I'd really like to win this one. Uh, I think Melbourne uh, are a, a sneaky contender and it would be nice to put a game or two, but like they're level with us on, on points at the moment. Be nice to put a game uh, between us and them uh, heading into the bye. Um, yep, and I, I think we, I actually, my my view is we might sneak over the line on this one. I think it'll be quite a tough game. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm thinking that we can we can win it. Um, but you know, it'll be the similar type of effort that we had last week, where everybody puts in and everybody does a little bit. Well, Atkins joins in this time, um, and because uh, the weather will suit him a little bit better. But uh, I just think that we can probably just sneak in by a small margin, but I think it's going to be a tough game. You know, it's interesting. But do you have a couple of... Sorry, mate. I was just going to point out quickly, it's interesting, Maki, you mentioned uh, Maxi Gorn, and you're right. Um, and yet when you look at uh, the stats again, uh, Melbourne and Carlton basically broke even on clearances, uh, notwithstanding Gorn's dominance and uh, Melbourne's midfield supremacy in terms of personnel. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't a, a stoppage clearance or a centre clearance dominance that got them that win. It was just efficiency with the ball and multiple avenues to goal, which I think we can counter. Yeah, that, yeah the, the options in the forward line were the thing for mm, them. Yeah, I think we're going to build them um, um, in the middle, and I think that we're going to like our Bash brothers are just going to cause them a little bit more discomfort. <laughs> and I think um, I think that they're going to break down because they haven't been challenged for a long time and. When sides like Brisbane and that did it to them earlier in the year, they crumbled, and I think they've had a soft run, and I think they're weak mentally, and they're going to crumble under us. Was Jack Viney injured last last week? The first game back. Yeah, he only had the 12 yeah, first, touches. First game back. 12 touches. Yeah, so he'll, uh, he'll be better for the running. Yeah. I do think, though, they, ha- they have a couple of little angry little inside ants um, mm. who have had their way with us previously, and I think that they might not. Um, get their way with um, with Cam and Hugh in there. I think they'll find it a little bit tougher yeah. uh, with those bigger bodies in there this, this week. Yeah, and it's uh, uh, Eddie's nemesis again. Uh, it will be interesting oh, to watch yeah. as well, Neville Jetta. He, he was quiet yeah. last week, but probably didn't need to do much, but uh, he's traditionally caused Eddie some grief. But Eddie found some form last Friday night, so that's going to be a very interesting battle, I think. Mm. And uh, Eddie will want to be showing off down there. Well, yeah, but I never will probably want to counter that, I would imagine. So, very interesting game, um, and in the context of of, uh, trying to get to the buy in reasonable shape, uh, quite an important one. Obviously, it is the last game of the round uh, in the 2.50 on Sunday afternoon. Um, So, uh, by the end of the round, or by the end of that game, we'll be ready to hook into the wrap macker. We'll be fresh. Yeah. Yes. Mac, yep. If that's if Macca <laughs> makes it to the weekend, by the sounds of it. <laughs> well, what was I supposed to do, mate? I don't know. Disagree <laughs> with me. Uh, right now, we've got to crack on uh, because we're already late. Uh, Pete, how are you tracking, mate? You got a few more minutes? I've got about four more minutes. Oh well, if you disappear, then. But if I if I have to bail, I have to bail. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, quickly, um, donkey competitions, mate. All right, we've got the um, Dream Team League, and I'll just run through the uh, the top four. Um, we've got Sal uh, Wheat, uh, Peter, uh, and first, Dylan, FCC, second, uh, Peanut, uh, the Winter March, third, and uh, Corey Alts in fourth. Um, uh, second to last is uh, is uh, Phoenix, and uh, um, I've got the points over you again this week, Phoenix. So yeah, we both lost, happy. though. We both suck. Doesn't matter. I was better than you. That's yeah. all. That's all my season is at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Both our benchmarks are pretty bloody shallow at the moment, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. No. I'm. Uh, I've had a shocker. I've. Uh, I decided to keep Josh Kelly when he was out for one week about six weeks ago, and yeah. Um, yeah. he's biting me in the ass. Um, just getting to. Just tipping. getting to tipping. Don't want to do uh, no, everyone, I've got to open. Everyone got yeah, seven. Uh, Everyone got seven, uh, except for me. I got five because I'm an idiot, um, and I tip differently in this one than I did the AFL one for some reason, where I got seven. Um, 
And uh, where are we? So we've got Dominic first, uh, Jason McKay on the chat. Uh, he's in second, uh, one point behind. Uh, B Short is third. And uh, QS Cellar Dwellers, definitely not Cellar Dwelling, coming in fourth. No, doing um, right. And it uh, looks like uh, I'm the uh, top of the top of the casters, so that's very good. Uh, are you top or are you equal? I oh, know you're one above me. Uh, no, where's Maka? Where are you, Maka? No, I'm, I'm oh, you're yeah, not yeah. in that one. No, Maka, no. Maka doesn't want to play with us in any of these things. Uh, Peter J's. No. Peter I'm J's in a thousand leagues already. Yeah. yeah. All right, very good. Speaking of Maka, let's uh, let you have your say quickly, Maka. Maka's sweets and smacks. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Go for it, mate. Yeah, yeah, just keep something. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a couple of sweeps, and uh, I think everybody knows who they're going to be. Hugh Greenwood and Campbell and gentlemen. Boys, just keep it up. You, you guys are fantastic. And uh, big sweeps to them. A few smacks. Uh, we've spoken about the fitness team, and I won't say any more than that, but Burton, I thought you were shocking on that interview, and a big smack over there for you for that one. The umpire who paid that free against Talia, you have no idea. You've obviously never played football in your life and you don't understand what's going on. Uh, he totally did not take that bloke's leg. He just kept running in there, tripped himself over there, got himself a free kick and you just got, uh, gifted them a goal. No idea, mate. Whack for you. And the uh, AFL, for allowing such a weak game to go up to China. Fancy sending up the Gold Coast up there. Now they're talking about the Giants next year. Well... They obviously uh, anticipate the Giants are going to go shit house because they only send shit house teams up there. <laughs> and I think, and I think, you know, if you're going to send somebody up there to represent the AFL and to represent the competition uh, overseas to, as a showpiece, at least send something that's worth looking at. Uh, you know, the Gold Coast are never going to win that game. And uh, stop lying about how many people went to the game. There's no bugger there. No. So, uh, and uh, I think that's about. It. Enough wax for me. Enough wax. Uh, at risk of blowing up a conversation when we're trying to race to the finishing line, I reckon uh, Bomber Thompson deserves a smack for the bloody leaked email uh, to David Evans. I don't know whether you blokes got around that at all, but basically... No, I haven't. Oh, it came out last week and Caro talked about it last <coughs> night. Um, but oh, I won't I go did. through the transcript, but it was basically... Uh, Bomber and and uh, by association heard blaming David Evans for not protecting the players and the coaches and every other bastard. And as Caro rightly pointed out, uh, Bomber and Herdy brought that on themselves. It wasn't David Evans at all. David was trying to fix the bloody the thing, and uh, in the end, he had to fall on his sword. But uh, just you know, bloody train wreck. But yeah, get if you can Google Google the. Uh, Google the article; it's worth a worth a read. I heard I heard what uh, Caro said, and uh, and she did defend the bloke you were talking about, um, and uh, to saying that you know Bomber and Hoodie they they, they got to take their own rap, mm. and quite right about that. And yeah, Bomber has, uh, PJ, he's got more issues than an email. He's got more, a lot of problems, and obviously yeah. needs a bit of help. Yeah, let's look into. Oh, sorry, go on. Hurry, hurry, boys! You guys, uh, I'll leave you to Game of, Game of Thrones, and I'll uh, I'll catch you next week. Very good, thank you, Peter. Cheers, boys. See you, mate. And without further ado, let's quickly do Game of Thrones. Crows. Game of Thrones. Come on, Peter. Well, what do we do? We did score involvements, didn't we? And I haven't updated the bloody table, so people are probably wondering what the hell's going on. But that's all right. Uh, I can quickly tell you who won what. Um, where are we? Sorry, one moment, please. Score involvements. So we had uh, Eddie Betts and Paul Seesman on five. I think there was a few that chose those two blokes. We had Gibbsy on four. And then Josh Jenkins and Lockie Murphy uh, on three. So... Uh, I reckon a few people might have fallen over choosing uh, the Bash Brothers um, or Rory Laird. I think I chose Rory Laird from memory or even Richie Douglas. Uh, but if you chose Eddie or Seed, you get five. Um, uh, you get three points. If you chose Gibbsy, you get two points. And if you chose... I like it, though. My bet. Yeah, I think so. If you chose JJ or Lockie Murphy, you uh, sneak in there with a point. And uh, I'll take whatever uh, bashing I receive and update 
the uh, scoreboard uh, sometime over the next couple of days, and I'll I'll tweet out an updated scoreboard because I know that uh, I've been a little bit slack in that regard. I reckon that's just about us done, gentlemen. Um, Do you have a question for this week? Yeah, What's that? Sorry. Oh, the question, question for this week? week. I keep forgetting that. Oh, I'm actually I'm actually not not very good. Um, All right, I like you. I like you, Frank. <laughs> Uh, let's go, uh, where do we go, where do we go, let's go uncontested possessions this week, so uh, that spreads it around a little bit to, as a bit of a guide, uh, last week uncontested possessions were Gibson with 11, Laird with 10, Dougie with 9 and Gibbs with 9, what do we reckon, it's going to be an open that. game. I'm working on Atkins getting twenty, uh, say twenty-one <laughs> possessions and twenty uncontested. Yeah, it, it's a toss-up between the rat and lead for me, uh, and, uh, and I think I might go with the desk. Oh, I'm going <laughs> yeah, to, I'm going to go with the gnome. I think, I think the gnome is going to get, uh, going to rack up getting the ball. Uh, so, yep, yeah, uh, tweet us or Facebook us or drop it in the in the um, thread on Big Footy. Um, uncontested possessions this week uh, in the game versus Melbourne at Traeger Park thanks everybody for joining us on the chat, thank you uh, to the people that listen to us on demand don't forget you can listen to us on the Spreaker website or on iTunes uh, aflcrowcast.com is our website, aflcrowcast on Twitter or Facebook, thanks Maka thanks Donkey, see you later no worries, no worries. No, 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 no